Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's RCEA presentation on innovation of footbridges, the AVA project. Um, just a, a few reminders, uh, the RCEA has an event next um, uh, on, on the 10th of June on the Warrington Dive Under. So if you do want to join them, please uh, visit the ICE website. The events are uh, the event descriptions and everything's already on there so you can register for the event. And um, without further ado, I'll give a brief um, introduction to the speakers tonight for this um, very interesting talk. We have um, Anthony Dewar, who is the technical head of buildings and architecture for Network Rail, Chris Wise, Senior Director for Expedition Engineering, Oliver Beecham, architect for Hawkins Brown, Noel Lovett, um, head of operations for Extreme Systems, and Phil Webb, managing director for Walker Constructions. So, Ross, if you could uh, kindly share your screen, please. Many thanks for the introduction, uh, Gabrielle. So good evening, everyone. I'm Anthony Dewar. I work in Network Rail's technical authority, and in conjunction with the Network Rail regions, we've reinvigorated our approach to station footbridges through new standard designs and research and development projects. Next, please. The presentation today is focused on the bridge uh, and the Ava Bridge, a station footbridge R&D project, part funded by Network Rail, part funded by Innovate UK. So in my slides today, I'll talk you through why we need to change and focus on research and development in this area. These pictures on the screen, I think, are really poignant to highlight why we as an industry need to change. Reflect for a moment how much society has changed from the late 1960s to today. How much our understanding of structural design and use of digital tools has advanced since the 1970s? Next, please. Reflect again for a moment on what a modern day passenger in 2021 and beyond expects from their train journey. We know the modern rail system is used by a range of diverse users and we need to ensure the rail system is accessible and inclusive to all. Next, please. So up until 2019, to access Network Rail standard footbridge drawings was via our standards catalogue and the footbridge drawings weren't available in a three-dimensional CAD format. Coupled with this, the design that we were using was a legacy design initially developed in the 1980s. So we recognised the clear need to embrace BIM and three-dimensional digital tools. Next, please. These are recent photographs of station footbridges being fabricated. Almost all of our footbridges are hand fabricated today using methodologies which even some of the early railway builders in Victorian times would have been familiar with. Each of our steel station footbridges are a bespoke build and I will use automotive comparisons throughout my presentation to highlight the need for change. So if we were building cars, our approach would be, be, be building bespoke hand built cars each time we build a footbridge. So this is much like what was undertaken prior to Henry Ford's Model T. Next, please. The photo in the bottom left of this slide is of a footbridge being transported to site at the opening of one of the early motorways in the UK, almost 60 to 70 years ago. The other photos are of recent footbridge installations on the UK rail network. So the logistics and construction techniques we utilise to install states and footbridges have had little change for several generations. Next, please. So reflect again on how other industries have been disrupted, modified and modernised. For example, Amazon, an example of modern manufacturing, supply on demand and efficient logistics. Next, please. And the Model T in 1908 is generally regarded as the first affordable car. Its relatively low price was partly the result of Ford's efficient fabrication and assembly line production instead of individual hand crafting. And we see how in 2021 the automotive industry has embraced Industry 4.0 using robotic modern methods of manufacturing. So yes, there are a lot of hurdles to overcome to achieve this in infrastructure station footbridges. 
supply chain continuity, procurement, technical to name but a few. But in UK infrastructure, we do build and install a lot of footbridges, noting network rail, high speed two, highways England, etc. Next, please. So with the four industrial revolutions, where is UK infrastructure construction at the moment? So if we're an honest as an industry, we're at best industry 1.5 in relation to station footbridges. So we have a journey to strive for for industry 4.0. Next, please. We also have an industry challenge in relation to time, cost and carbon. So an average two railway track, two platform, two lift footbridge total project cost is usually somewhere between three to four million pounds. Of this, less than 20% is the cost for the superstructure project, product, the steel, the glazing, the stair treads, etc. So over 80% is on other costs, management costs, prelims, risk, and noting a typical station project takes between nine to 12 months on site. Next, please. So if our station footbridges were cars, we had been using a 1980s Skoda, but we have developed new standard designs in network rail called the frame, the beacon and the ribbon. But these have been using existing fabrication construction techniques and we published these in 2020. So Ava Bridge is like a concept cars and it's a concept car that we're developing to bring to the high street by next year, looking towards industry 4.0 for station footbridges. I'll now hand over to Chris Wise from Expedition Engineering to introduce the Ava Consortium and the design approach. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, next slide, please, Ross. So yeah, we have, um, it's an unusual project in that all the members of the team were present at the beginning. So <laughs> unlike most construction projects where uh, People, people uh, on the design side and the client side are there at the beginning, but then contractors and manufacturers tend to often come in later on. And so their expertise isn't available until quite late in the project. All the members, of, all the key members of the AVA team were involved right at the beginning. And as Anthony said, it's an innovation project. So we, rough numbers, it's, a, it's about a six million pound project. So it's not trivial. Um, and that includes all of the innovation costs, the R&D costs, as well as the construction costs for a demonstrator, which is going to be built next, uh, very early next year. So uh, it starts on site in January. And the key members of the team are Network Rail, as Anthony said, who are co-funding it, Walker Construction, who are the manufacturing part, uh, the construction partner, Expedition, which is our company, which is, uh, as some of you may know, a, engineering design company, uh, Extreme Systems, who are, uh, uh, let's say, a 21st century manufacturing company, heavily digitally based, um, specializing in advanced metal structures and systems, and the Manufacturing Technology Center, who are working with the team on a digital configuration tool, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. And then in addition, and actually playing no small part, and Ollie Beach and from Hawkins Brown is here, are Hawkins Brown who are working alongside us as architects, Tellier 10 who are doing lighting. The Norman Foster Foundation, and Norman Foster in particular, personally has been acting as a critical friend to the project, so he's been challenging us on what we're doing. Uh, SCX who are um, a, a, a movement uh, manufacturing specialists. So they do things like uh, moving roofs to stadia and um, large crane systems and that sort of thing, automated robotic. Um, and we have retained them to design for us and make for us uh, a new sort of lift specifically for access for all bridges to try and um, improve on the, the sort of things that are many of you will be familiar with around the railway, brick clad, built on site a bit a bit um, 19th century, 20th century and quantum infrastructure, Ross Chipperfield, who is our project manager. Um, and it's part of the Ties Living Lab project, which is over an overall project, um, which has a, a series of innovation projects in the infrastructure and transportation space of which this is one. 
Next, please, Ross. And so what are we trying to do? Um, it, uh, footbridges are very familiar and it's very hard to, they're very hard to design, um, to, uh, certainly to do something new, but we've set our ambitions quite high. So we're, t we're trying to do reliable access for all bridges for as many of the network rail stations as we possibly can and to set a, an example of how that can be done in other infrastructure sectors so that everybody can enjoy the, uh, the use of public transport, which of course has a big impact on potential impact on the climate emergency. Uh, we obviously want to deliver better value for the taxpayer. Um, we want to do a beautiful piece of work, um, a timeless project that improves everybody's lives. Um, we want to improve the, the performance of the of, of footbridges and, and lifts and the railway itself by making things last longer, perform better, lower running costs, more reliability, um, better experience for everybody using the railway, including the staff and the people who have to maintain these um, industrial structures. Um, as Anthony said, we wanted we want to do an in, uh, an industry 4.0 project as far as we can. So one which is digitally driven, digitally designed, digitally manufactured, and takes advantage of contemporary technology. We want to respect the climate, a hundred percent, hundred and twenty percent, I would say, through what we call lean start, long life, loose fit principles. Um, we are trying to calibrate the project against what people have done historically, but that's turned out to be a little tricky because mainly because historically people haven't always recorded everything that might be useful in terms of um, passing that information down to their successors. So we're, we're building up a benchmark set as well. Uh, and we're trying to do a, a sort of macro case study through a demonstration of how you can design an, an industrial uh, product which can be repeated many, many times in different configurations uh, and gradually learn from itself. So it gets better and better and better so that each time you 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 build it. And we're looking for things where we can build a thousand of them or 10,000 of them rather than just one amazing single glory project. So it's an example of trying to get really good design and manufacture into everyday project um, assets. Next please, Ross. Uh, and the key, the key metrics of what we so far managed to achieve, we think um, about a third reduction in the capital cost, about two thirds reduction in the time on site, um, 75, so three quarters of uh, um, reduction in the overall project program, including design and commissioning, and about a two thirds reduction in uh, possessions and um, impact on the railway during construction roughly 50 to 60 percent reduction in emissions um, over the life of the project, um, a doubling of the service life, um, a hundred percent increase in the reliability of the lifts and we'll come on to the the way the lifts have been designed and the core benefits are that we as I said we we want to provide equality so that everyone can use the railway. Um, we have designed the system so it's, we haven't just designed a single bridge or a single lift. We've designed a system which is has um, the ability to be configured for um, a specific response to every site or as many sites as we possibly can. Um, and so it's an adaptable, reconfigurable uh, system rather than a single bridge design. Um, and yeah, we're trying to we're trying to position unashamedly to do it as a, a piece of UK innovation so that we can help UK PLC to um, to well, basically to trade globally and to be a consistent influencer in this space globally. Next, please. Um, so I mentioned there are a couple of well, it's a it's a reconfigurable um, project. There are two basic configurations, and these are very um, marginal in their differences superficially, but actually they mean quite a lot. So on the uh, and these have many, many variations, but the two fundamental configurations are what we're calling the narrow configuration and the wide configuration. And the narrow one is a traditional, pretty traditional footbridge with the lifts are um, opposite the staircase. Everybody, um, there is always a clash where people coming out of the lift, sometimes in wheelchairs or 
with small children or shopping um, meet people charging up the staircase and that little um, T-shaped connection there can be quite a challenge. Um, so there's a with the scheme we prefer and if we can do it on uh, network rail sites if there's enough room we want to do a scheme where they called the wide scheme which is on the right hand side where um, everybody approaches from the same direction and if the flow is continuous so there's no crossover and so if you the lifts are through lifts so you can come in from one side go straight up to the top straight onto the deck and across and back down again without ever having to change direction which for um, mobility impaired people is can be difficult and for people who are carrying small children also difficult so any either of those are possible with this system uh, is the, the components are the same they're just arranged in different ways next please uh, and a whole series of variations of how to do it and the the idea is that the system works on uh, two track two platform um, stations but it also works on medium sized stations where you have four tracks six tracks eight tracks uh, and can also the, the arrangement can flip so you can have stairs and lifts um, uh, on the top right hand side um, opposed to each other so that if you have a station entrance away from where the center of mass of the uh, center of gravity of the railway platform and the trains are you can actually flip the system as well so lots of different potential configurations next Ross please um, so the basic narrow configuration is like this fairly traditional um, in its setup so what I should say about it at this point so it does look quite traditional actually we think in the end when it's when it's built it will look anything anything but traditional but the it's a piece of manufacturing not a piece of construction so and what we mean by that is uh, in fact when we started working on it Noel from Extreme who's going to talk a little bit later from the manufacturer said you can have anything you like as long as it's made out of metal anything you can imagine we can make out of metal and that sounded fantastic and then he then um, that was followed a minute or two later when he said as long as it's made out of sheets which are no bigger than three meter by 1.5 meters so this entire bridge system and the lifts and the everything pretty much everything you can see here is made out of pieces of folded cut bent laser cut machined metal all of which originates in a three meter by a 1.5 meter uh, metal sheet and the metal we've chosen to use is stainless steel because it has the the, the basic um, cost and carbon is a little bit higher than uh, mild steel and carbon steel but it has much better performance in use much better um, service life and also it's much easier to clean and to um, to replace than something which is has to be continuously maintained and painted so this is all carbon steel all made out of three meter by 1.5 meter stainless shield steel sheet and when you think about that you have to bolt it all together or weld it together we've tried we've taken out all the welding so it's all bolted which means they're all preloaded bolts, which uh, means uh, effectively they are uh, put together under tension so that um, in principle they can't unlock and work loose during and given they have a 120 year design life, that's very important over the railways. Next, please. Uh, and the, we have a purpose designed lift system, which is uh, a modular system. So the lifts that are shown here are made in the factory, uh, they, the car, the lift, the shaft, the drive system and the lift pit are all made as a module pre-commissioned in the factory, laid flat and delivered to site on the back of a flatbed and are then lifted in as a single piece. And effectively you can push a button and they should work straight away. And if you compare that with a traditional footbridge lift system, which many of you will have seen being built, uh, which has a shaft and then people come and build brickwork afterwards, the lift is built in situ inside the shaft. That's a, a, a radical change. It also means that these lifts can be retrofitted onto existing footbridges, so you can provide access for all capability on existing footbridges as well. And those are being made, uh, designed and made by SCX in conjunction with the AVA consortium. Next, please. 
And this is a wide arrangement. Um, uh, it's actually, this is an earlier, slightly earlier version than the scheme, we, the, the version we have now, um, which has the lifts on the far side and the staircase both um, so that you can come side by side up to the up to the deck. Um, next one, please. And then you can also do either of these schemes, the narrow or the wide will work because the lifts are independent modules. You can do them also without lifts in some situations that's desirable. So they, the lifts stand alone and so do the uh, bridge systems. Next, please. I think at this point I'll, I'll uh, so Hawkins Brown have been working with us all the way through the design process and Ollie Beecham's done a fantastic job. So I'm going to hand over to Ollie to take us through the some of the uh, CGI's and some other work on the uh, the feel of the project. Ollie. Cheers, thanks very much Chris. Um, so yeah, so I think it's worth probably starting in that um, we started this design process um, looking at passenger experience. We want this to be a bridge for, for all users um, and for everyone to have a, as good an um, experience as possible on it. Um, and our key thinking with this was that we offer a very clear route for people um, and a route which is open, uh, well lit and really safe to use. So Ava, as we can see on the screen here, um, basically a bridge which consists of a um, floating walkway and also a floating canopy which sits on top. Very subtle and very simple. Um, and what the parapet and the canopy do are um, they're extruded forms. Um, so what that does is it ensures a cohesive um, bridge product rather than a, these disjointed bridges that we often see in other, see in other contexts, which are made up of separate elements um, with you know, perhaps a certain design language for the span and a different one for the stairs. And what that can be is quite confusing um, uh, visually on the eye, but also quite confusing to use as a passenger. So Ava, we feel, is, is quite understated and it's quite refined. And what it does to, is, is aims to neutralise um, what can sometimes be quite a visually cluttered um, and confusing station environment. So the lean and efficient structure and the skin reduce that visual um, obstruction um, and, and offer clear and coherent um, user, user experience as you make your way up and over. Next slide, please, Ross. So as Chris touched on, we're taking advantage of digital design, cutting, folding, machining. Um, and what we've tried to do again to keep the language uh, nice and calm is to use a simple palette of materials. So stainless steel, we know it offers very good strength and robustness. Um, and from a maintenance point of view, it's really easy to clean. So some of these bridges um, get quite a lot of, um, uh, <laughs> they get quite a lot of people misusing them perhaps. So um, we've we've kept that in the back of our minds that they will be, um, they will be heavily used um, and possibly graffitied, uh, for example. Um, so the stainless steel offers a robustness um, and then placing folds in, in the metal gives us increased strength. Um, but what it also does uh, for the design is offers a really subtle um, wayfinding um, element. So passengers on this bridge essentially can follow one of the folds in the panels up the stairs, across the span and all the way down because the same language is used um, throughout the journey. And then we've tried to use glass as much as possible because we think uh, these bridges are much nicer to, um, to experience when there's plenty of light. Um, and what that also does is offer a safer passenger environment. So we've made sure that as you turn corners, you, can, you have very good visibility. As you come out the lift, you have very good visibility. Um, and then one thing we know is um, quite difficult um, over railways is, is glass maintenance. So we haven't provided uh, more glass than we need um, and we've made sure that we can maintain and clean this glass from within the bridge deck. So we, we don't need to put up you know, any tricky uh, temporary access equipment to be able to clean large expansive um, areas of glass. 
And then as Chris touched on, access for all is a really key element. Um, we believe these bridges should always be provided with lifts. Um, and we've worked really hard to provide an uncluttered um, entrance to the lifts. So any structural legs are tucked in um, nice and close to the lift shaft. Um, and then within the lift shaft itself, uh, we've provided glazing uh, on both sides, um, which we think allow for better user orientation. Uh, they can see where they are at all times um, and again offer a much safer um, pasture experience from for those users. And then beneath the stair at the base, um, we know we have restricted headroom and we need plant space. So we've tucked in a, um, a, a plant room uh, below the bottom of each stair. Uh, what that also um, offers is a chance to activate that space. So we have um, some seating um, and then potential community customization um, uh, in that area. So offering something back to the community to make the, this bridge um, their own. Next slide, please, Ross. So this diagram really, um, really shows the modul modularity and kind of standardization that we're, we're striving for. So each module is set out on a 1.2 meter grid, and these are essentially um, uh, repeated modules um, on the flat and then on the stair pitch line. And what we've what we've done here is integrated services as much as possible, um, trying to move away from um, post fixed services, um, which are quite um, well, not particularly appealing um, to look at and don't don't seem very considered. So we have uh, capable management systems integrated within the parapet at low level, and we've tried to keep service runs at low level as much as possible because we know they're easier to maintain. And then where we do need services in the roof or CCTV cameras or speakers, we, um, we're routing services within our structural legs um, to conceal them. Uh, and then we have hinged access panels uh, throughout the roof soffit to allow for easy access. What we've also done is we know that uh, different stations bring different um, challenges. Um, so our parapet system has been designed in a way that um, it's always solid up to one meter from the finished floor level. But then above that, you have options to plug in um, either a, a low level uh, metal sheet, a low level uh, plate of glass or high level uh, plates of glass. And if you uh, see fit, you can also fully enclose um, the bridge walkway using the same uh, plug and play parapet system. So, the ambition here is for, for the bridge to be slim and, and visually lightweight so that it's not dominating to the um, surrounding area. Um, but we think it's really important for it to own its own contemporary aesthetic, um, which we feel is in itself respectful to any surrounding heritage rather than borrowing materials or um, becoming a, a pastiche type um, of structure. And one of the, one of the key um, the key moves to make this as lightweight as possible is to slim down the profiles of, of most of our elements. So the roof, uh, the roof canopy has a very slim, thin um, edge profile as it wraps around. And then the same with the top of the parapet as well. So next slide, please, Ross. Right, so now we give you the opportunity to have a little explore of the Ava Bridge yourself. So hopefully this will work. If you get your phone camera out and um, just hold it over the barcode, then a web page should pop up at the top. And you should be able to navigate to a, a live web page where you can walk around the, um, uh, the bridge from a, a number of views. And I'm going to try and share my screen here. So apologies if it all goes wrong. Here we go. So this is a really great tool where we can instantly um, envisage the uh, the bridge in a in a specific context. Um, and what we can do is flip to different areas of the bridge. Um, 
and really get a feel for the internal passenger experience um, and also move between daytime, uh, dusk and nighttime itself. And I think from from these uh, 360 renders, we really get a feel of the simplicity of the um, passenger spirit experience from within. Um, so I'll let you have a play around with that yourselves uh, on your phones, and I'm going to now hand back over to Noel. Thank you, Ollie. Uh, no love it. Extreme Systems Limited. We are the manufacturing partner within the consortium. So I'm just going to take the opportunity over the next few slides just to talk to you around the manufacturing process and the prototyping that we've done so far. So as Chris has already said, we we have a digitalized manufacturing environment. So we have processes, equipment, software that's all aligned to Industry 4.0. Next slide, please, Ross. So essentially, we take the model that's been created by Expedition and we take that model and pull it into our manufacturing software, which is SolidWorks. The SolidWorks software essentially digitally transfers it from Revit into manufacturing environment. Next slide, please. And quite simply, we take the main model and we break it down then to sub level components, as you can see here. And following that, we then, next slide, please. We then take it down to actual individual components. Next slide, please. So once we add the individual components alongside the manufacturing drawings, we then take this into a further piece of software. So it's all digitalized still. And this software not only does it ensure that those components that have been modeled are exacting when we take them into the manufacturing site, it also allows us to digitally put all the parts into nests to ensure that we're getting the best sheet utilization which essentially is a way that we are reducing our carbon next slide please so here i'm just going to show some photos of the actual equipment that we're using all of the parts and components that we manufacture are supported by our erp system which essentially means that every item, that every component that we manufacture has got its own digital footprint. So we have full traceability of every item. Also with the equipment that we actually use, it allows us to manufacture components to a very high tolerance. And those tolerances in this project, we are holding on each component between 0.2 and 0.5 millimeter so with a very high degree of confidence when the components are manufactured we know when they get to the assembly that they will fit together next slide please so we have a very short video just to show you some of the processes and some of the parts that we've actually manufactured for the samples and these are essentially automated pieces of equipment that have been pre-programmed with the components. So we are working in a data-driven environment and the data-driven environment allows us to make informed decisions and it gives us full control over all of our processes. Next, please. So, as Chris mentioned earlier, this is uh, a new innovative project and bringing manufacturing into the construction world essentially, which has not been done or very little of it's been done. 
And what we wanted to do is we wanted to ensure that the way that we are designing the bridge, that essentially by bringing these components together, that we can actually produce a product that is structurally sound. Next slide, please. And essentially what we've got here are these precision components and pictures of those precision components that we pull together in the prototype. Next slide, please. And finally, we see the assembly of the prototype that we have successfully completed, which has not only allowed us to ensure that it is structurally sound, but it's also driven the behavior now for the, for the future design. Thank you. And I will now pass you over to Phil Webb. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Phil Webb. Um, I'm the Managing Director of Walker Construction, and we are the build partner of the consortium and um, the partner that's got probably the most railway experience out of the, all the members of the consortium. Um, I'm first going to give you a, a, a bit of an update on the lifts. I know Chris has sort of covered it sort of briefly in his introduction. Um, when we took the innovation project on, um, it was all about the bridge and the stairs, and we were always going to put lifts in, but we were going to we were going to use um, normal lifts, traditional lifts that are used in the railway environment. After many discussions with Network Rail about the reliability, the accessibility of their portfolio of lifts, it made us come to the decision that it would be amiss of us if we didn't consider the lifts as well and try and um, use some innovation to create a complete new lift system. Um, the consortium decided to go to a company that did not manufacture lifts as part of its core business and probably didn't have that much railway experience because we wanted them to think outside the box. Um, SCX projects are experts in engineering solutions for lifting and mechanical handling. Um, some of their notable projects are the retractable roof at Centre Court and the retractable pitch at Tottenham, Hot Tottenham Hotspur Football Ground. We gave ourselves a challenge on the lift, a design lift that was user friendly, more accessible, was adaptable to different spatial configurations of the bridge structure that was independent from the bridge. So it could be installed as a plug and play component to an existing bridge. And also it was important to resolve some of the reliability and maintenance issue that network, network rail faced with their existing portfolio of lifts. The list will be designed, manufactured, and assembled, installed to all the applicable code standards and requirements, the lift directive and the lift regu regulations to name two. The lift can be used as a through lift or a single door entry exit, depending on the configuration, with more enough room for the wheelchair to turn around and more enough room to go straight through. The lift will be belt driven with all motors, traction drive pulleys, clutches, etc., mounted inside the lift shaft on the lift spine. It will have dual motors and drives, etc., and effectively dual redundancy. So in theory, the amount of time the lift is out of service should be very, very minimal, if any time at all. For the lift, we will not be designing or manufacturing any bespoke components. All the components that we're going to be using are basically off the shelf components that, um, that can be used again. So part of our agreement with IUK, one of our funding partners, that as part of the innovation, we had to design and manufacture and install something that was repeatable. Um, as part of our design, we have designed out the need for a lift pit. There will be an integral pit as part of the pit frame, which will sit inside the structural bridge of the foundation. The intention is that the new lift will be pre-assembled and tested as much as possible within the factory. This includes the lift shaft, the secondary steel, the cladding, the lift cars, the motors, the belts and the drives. Next please, Ross. Um, this picture here shows one of the prototypes of the lift car and the door arrangement that um, SCX are currently putting together in their, in their facility in Sheffield. Uh, next please, Ross. As I said, each lift module will come complete, tested and commissioned as far as possible. So when we get to site, it should be a case of lifting it into position and plugging it in, although that's probably a simplistic view. 
Um, the modules will be laid flat, transportation bolts will be inserted in the required locations, um, popped on a flatbed lorry and delivered to site. Next please, Ross. Um, this gives you just a, um, an indication of how we're going to lift the modules into place um, and the arrangement for the lifting tackling gear. But the idea is to lift it into a vertical position before actually moving it across into its final position. So that gives you a bit of a flavour about the lift. We're now we're going to move on to site construction. So um, before I start on the site construction, I just wanted to articulate that although this is an innovation project, innovation is not always possible without collaboration. As a group, we started off with a blank piece of paper and the knowledge of what we did not want to design, we did not want to fabricate and we did not want to build. I think the word fabricate is the, is the key word here. We are now on the cusp of something truly special that is designed, manufactured and built, which we believe could disrupt both fabrication and manufacturing markets in different ways. From purely a principal contractor's point of view, the whole process has been truly refreshing. Obviously, as a consortium, we have all had our challenges individually and collectively with the project and still do so. But it's apparent this type of collaboration is a key to the to the project's success. And if only all cons construction projects could be managed in this way. Uh, so now I'll move on to site construction. Next slide, please, Ross. So this is currently what we do. This is a footbridge that we installed a number of years ago. Um, basically, the foundations of reinforced concrete piled foundation, including lift pits. We have temporary works for piling mat, crane mat, earthwork support, formwork, etc. Um, it's a mild steel bridge. It's heavy. It has an M1 paint finish on it. Next slide, please, Ross. As you can see, the, the superstructure is lifted into place, which is the bridge, the stairs and the lift shafts. This is done over a series of abnormal possessions, um, but there's no finishes on it. Next slide, please, Ross. So most of the finishes are retrofitted, if you like. So the main superstructure is installed in, I don't know, 27 or 52 hour abnormal possessions. And really, that's probably the most problem, the less problematic part of the inst installation process. But on this particular bridge at West Hampstead, nearly all the finishes, which is the cladding, the glazing, the lift and the lift cars, the stair treads, the handrails, the lighting, was all retrofitted. This is done either during normal working days or primarily done on shorter possessions, rules of the route or line blocks. Um, which has the uh, has the effect of um, elongating the program, elongating contractors management and premium costs. So it ends up costing more money. Um, the average um, duration on site for a footbridge of this type is somewhere between six and 12 months. Obviously, it's very dependent on what's in the ground, the unforeseen conditions. Um, we always seem to get criticised when we're installing footbridges is that by third parties, passenger groups, passengers, train operating companies, that their expectation is that once the superstructure is installed, why is it not finished quicker? They're not only seeing that the superstructure is the biggest part of it, but it's the finishes that take the time and can, can elongate the project three, four, five months past the um, superstructure installation. Next slide, please, Ross. So we looked at our design brief and how the design brief was set. We've looked at the, um, the requirements of the government's 2025 construction strategy, and we've tried to apply as many of those in our, in our thinking as we've moved through the process. So for the demonstrator site where we're building the full scale model at, at the test track in Widmerpool, we've designed out the need for reinforced concrete foundations. Um, we're gonna be using uh, screw piles on a steel grillage with mechanical fixings between the screw pile and the steel bridge, and then conversely between the steel bridge and the superstructure. Obviously, final foundations will be dependent on bespoke locations. Um, and it, I think it's true to say that with the way the design's put together, the superstructure or the substructure is probably the, the main variable in terms of construction time and cost. No lift pit means we have no 
or reduce temporary works. The superstructure, and this is this is the important thing, the superstructure will be manufactured and assembled and commissioned off site. Complete with all finishes or as many finishes that we can get that we can install onto it, which includes cladding, glazing, hand rails, hand rails, lighting, etc. The superstructure will come to site, assembled on a um, as required basis. So our intention is that at the test site that we can install all 10 to 12 components of the bridge in a 52 hour possession. Um, our wish is that we can get this down to a 27 hour possession. That's our, our long term goal. Um, in terms of craneage and site installation, because of the material we're using, which is obviously stainless steel, I mean, a normal footbridge that we're installing today is the main span is probably between one and two tons per meter, but we're using lighter materials. So in terms of cranes, we're going to be using smaller cranes, which means reduced temporary works, etc., etc. Next, please, Ross. So this just takes us through um, a quick construction sequence. I won't sort of talk about every individual um, um, diagram sort of one by one, but it shows the foundations going in first then the, the steel grillages, then we erect the, the main support towers, and then we start putting some of the components together, i.e. the stairs. Next, next slide, please, Ross. And the way it's been designed is as we go through the construction sequence, we're trying to design out the need for any major temporary works to support the structure as we erect it. So the stairs go on, then the, then the bridge, and then, then we lift the lift units into place. Again, next slide, please, Ross. Um, and then the final piece of the jigsaw are, are the roof elements. Um, it was our intention when we set off on the journey that we wanted the roof to become an integral part of the stairs and the span, but as the, de the designs developed, there's now a need to fit these separately. So overall, we've got 12 components, which we're quite confident that we can get on in a 52 hour possession. Um, and as I said before, the aim is to try and reduce that down to a 27 hour position. Overall, we believe, and this will be demonstrated when we do the, um, the demonstrator with Mapool, that we believe the duration on site should be no more than 12 weeks. And obviously if we're 12 weeks on site, a reduction in time means a reduction in cost. So overall, as um, Chris alluded to earlier, we're hoping that we can exceed our design brief of of saving at least 33% on the on the whole cost of the project. Um, so that sort of is a quick run through the construction. I'll just now hand you back to Chris, who will talk about the configurator. Uh, yeah, thanks. I've been I've been answering a bunch of uh, questions that I'm sure others have as well that uh, have appeared on the chat. So hopefully it's picked up some of the <laughs> some of your questions about what we're doing. Um, so we, I mentioned that it's a it's a configurable system. So it's not a single bridge. It's a configurable system. It's uh, it's in the end we've settled on a 1.2 meter module. Um, in principle, Industry 4.0 allows you to have to vary the module anything from that will fit within the sheet sizes that we're using. So we could be using um, uh, and that will tune itself to every site. So for example, you could have a module of um, 1023 millimeters uh, for one site and you might go up to 1279.1 millimeters for the module on another site. But we want the system to be one that is uh, very easy to retrofit if there is damage or replacement needed. So in the end, what we've decided to do is standardize the module, even though the system doesn't require it so that it makes maintenance and replacement easier. And within that system, we then have a configurator, which is a digital tool with intelligence built into it, which is designed to allow users to configure the, the bridge and lift system um, to suit their particular site. So it builds onto a digital model of the site. Um, it has a series of coded up rules. If you could show the next one, Ross. Um, series of um, coded up rules which are driven in the background by the user. And the user can say, here is my site. Um, I want to have um, lifts of a certain size. I have footfall of a certain size. 
um, I want a canopy or I don't want a canopy. I have um, OHLE overhead line equipment um, of particular configurations and coded into the algorithms are a series of rules which come from network rails operational requirements and their technical requirements not to mention um, the laws of physics from our side and a series of relationship um, rules which for example don't allow you to put two lifts next to each other or two, two um, staircases next to each other um, and the user can then say right okay I would like to know what a, an AVA bridge would look like on my site and what options have I got to um, adjust it and adapt it and the the configurator digital tool which the manufacturing technology center in Coventry are building for us will apply those intelligent algorithms to the modular system that we've developed so that it will produce something which will work firstly and secondly will be as far as possible compliant with the rules and regulations of the railway which is obviously fundamentally important and then it gives you a series of other um, things as a result so the next one please Ross so in, in very simple um, uh, language it's an object-based system so it's like many BIM um, tools but the um, there's intelligence between the the objects so they all have um, materials content, carbon content, they may have costs, they, they have um, lead times, they have um, uh, ma uh, material finishes and all that sort of thing uh, locked into the mod uh, to the modules. You code them in in two dimensions um, and shuffle around. You can push a button and get a default configuration if you want. And um, and then the the software will configure the bridge following the rules. So next one, please, Ross. And then um, it will um, take those two dimensional elements and the next step, which we can't show you yet because it hasn't been done yet, but it's being done, is to take the two dimensional mod modules and turn them into the three dimensional modules that we are developing with Extreme, uh, which come out of their SolidWorks digital model, which is the manufacturing model. And out of that comes uh, for the user, but also to go back into the gene pool, it can be used for as part of the, I mentioned benchmarking earlier, and there isn't much benchmarking. Well, this sets up a, a set of benchmark data on a common basis that can be used over and over and over um, for cost, service life, maintenance cycles. It has the maintenance plan in it. Uh, it has carbon data, including where, uh, particularly in the foundations and um, we should say one of the biggest places to save carbon on this project is to take the OPC and the deep excavations. Well, <laughs> in railway terms, deep excavations for lift pits and uh, incoming services out of the system or minimize them. So there's there's no OPC in the foundations of this bridge. It's all steel. Um, it gives you lead times and it gives you then um, the intention is that will feed into the manufacturer's um, production program. will tell you the lead time, will tell you when it's going to come off the production line, just like ordering a car. Um, it tells you when your car is going onto the production line, when it comes off. You've, con you've configured it with the various um, uh, extras that you might want. Um, and then there's a potential to export from that in three dimensions back into uh, a rendering set to produce the sort of things that Ollie showed you earlier or something simpler so that when you're choosing your options early on, you get a quick three dimensional uh, view of what it is that you're ordering. Um, and then the configurator is um, has a direct relationship to SolidWorks, so it will then input once you put say, yes, that's the bridge I would like in the same way that you say that's the car I would like it then Input or the, the kitchen I'd like if you're doing this at, at IKEA, it will, it will then input that directly into Extreme or the manufacturer's automated system and drive the SolidWorks model, which actually has a, a it, SolidWorks also has its own configuration tools in, which are a more refined set to do with the detailed manufacturing processes. So the aim is to integrate all of that, uh, to use it to drive the manufacturing process to help um, uh, commissioning. Um, uh, people to be able to know what it is they're buying and what the implications are and to enable it to um, produce outputs which can 
on a common basis be used to improve the quality of the product. Next, please. I think that's it in that case. So we'll we'll be happy to take questions and maybe I'll go back to Anthony just for a, a quick finish off. Yeah, so thank you everyone. That concludes our um, presentation for this evening and we're more than happy to take questions. I hope that's given you an overview of the, yeah, the client need for this piece of work, our digital design approach, digital manufacturing approach, a refreshed approach to installation and the, the use of the configurator so that this is, has a further life for its uh, digital uses. And so yeah, open it to the floor. Right, thank you very much, guys. We actually have, have had quite a lot of interest. Um, uh, well, there's 38 questions so far. So um, I know Chris and Oliver has already started answering a few of them. Perhaps we could do a handful of questions just for our viewers that don't have access to the chat pane. Um, I'll ask the audience if you, because there's too many questions, we probably won't, well, we likely won't be able to get through all of them. So if you there are any questions on there that you do uh, want a further discussion on or want to be answered to just please um click on the like button and i'll read from um from the most liked questions so um firstly uh i know you've answered this chris uh, already but how how will glare be avoided by the stainless steel finish of the footbridge which could which could create issues for drivers Yeah, two or three people asked that question. Yeah. And um, so we've done a technical study. In fact, all of the bridges, it's not just this one, but um, the ribbon and the beacon and network rails, other new generation bridges have all been subject to one, a glare study to one degree or another. And we piggyback those studies. Um, ours, by comparison with most of them, is using um, shot peen stainless which is it actually has quite a dull, um, uh, low re reflectivity. And the amount of glass, as Ollie said, is is pretty small. So by comparison with the other bridges that are on the um, on the horizon, we have a, a lower re reflectivity than others. And what we've done is we've tested the, the glare um, for basically a, a driver approaching um, from both directions and different orientations um, with the sun at different angles all the way through the year. So track the sun path and have concluded that the um, the glare is basically not a problem. It's very, it's um, minimal and the chances of it disturbing the drivers is very small. And somebody asked about, um, I think, whether it would affect passengers um, or users of the platforms. Perhaps I think maybe you thought we were going for polished stainless steel sort of thing you get in a bathroom, but we're not. It's um, it's a, a dull finish. For many reasons, actually, one of the reasons we want to do that is to um, minimise the consequences of vandalism for people scratching or um, spray painting the, the the surface. Thank you. If you know if you know um, Farringdon Station. There is a stainless uh, parapet inside Farringdon Station, which has been there for quite a long time, uh, which has probably a slightly shinier finish than the one that we're using. And you can get a sense of it in there if you ever happen to go through there on one of the overbridges. Thank you, Chris. Um, so the next question here, following on from your um, mentioning of stainless steel. Um, so as the material uses stainless steel, would any particular de-icing products be required for the underfoot safety in winter or would the normal use of rock salt be acceptable? Uh, that's two parts to that question. Ollie will pick up the, the um, he's the specialist on um, the, the walking surface. <laughs> Uh, but just a bit, just to say, and I've also picked this up in the chat as well. So we've done a microclimate study on the environment inside the, inside the under the canopy and inside the parapet and uh, above the deck. So that sets up a little microclimate, even though it's open. The the deck is uh, uh, sorry, the deck is uninsulated, and the canopy is insulated. And the reason, one of the main reasons, is to um, prevent 
um, frosting on the surface of the bridge. So what we want is nighttime radiation to basically, we want it to warm the underside of the bridge and warm the deck, but at the same time, not, re not radiate back out to the night sky. And what the study that we've done shows that it, that reduces the number of frosting events by between 80 and 90 percent in most of the country, which minimizes the amount of de-icing salts which are needed, which then extends the service life, which is a very significant, uh, but if you like, hidden benefit of this scheme. And Ollie can pick up the question about um, skidding and slipping and frosting and all those things. Yes, so, um, so traditionally footbridges um, tend to use um, so a lot of the footbridges used uh, GRP anti-slip um, uh, coverings or a resin bound aggregate, for example. And uh, while these work quite well um, in terms of uh, robustness and anti-slip, they're quite high in uh, embodied carbon. So what we've been looking at is an extruded aluminium uh, floor finish, which is extremely lightweight, um, a pretty good cost, um, and it offers a very high slip resistance um, uh, and a very long design life, which is uh, brilliant. And what it also does is it offers a, a porous, um, a porous floor finish. So instead of uh, surface uh, drains and surface gutters, which tend to block very easily, um, this essentially acts as a fully um, drained system. So the entire span uh, drains itself. Um, so Yes, yeah, so aluminium on the on the main span and then the same thing on the treads, very hard wearing cast aluminium plates on the um, on the stair treads. Um, and in terms of de-icing, as Chris said, we were hoping uh, not to use much. We think the um, microclimate reduces the need. Um, and then we know Network Rail have done a lot of uh, work on alternatives to rock salt um, and there are much better um, products to use, which um, which, which are kinder to these um, uh, these types of structures. Thanks, Oliver. Um, the next question here is about collision loads. Um, so as the narrow option is closer to the tracks, have collision loads been considered or the supports of the structure with outside the 4.5 meters from the running rail as per Euro codes? You know, Anthony, you were starting to reply to this, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I was just typing my response to that one. Um, yeah, th this is an area that I think has hindered uh, footbridge design in the past in some respects. So we've got permanent derogation in place for, for this bridge and that permanent derogation is yeah not to apply collision loads. We went through a risk-based approach, which we actually did with the frame, the beacon and the ribbon, and we've applied it to this project as well. That where you have a solid platform, the platform acts as the, the um, collision protection. Um, so yeah, we've got a permanent derogation to cover that. Where you don't have a solid platform, the, the derogation covers what measures that you need to take uh, to prevent uh, yeah, derailment. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, um, we've got another question here on um, on the 3D renders, it looks as though stainless steel sheets are covering the structural members. Has this been considered? Uh, how inspection of the structural components will be carried out? I suspect this is to do with um, hidden critical elements. Uh, so the first thing to say is, and I, I apologise, I didn't make it clear. The what you see is the structure. So there is no structure inside that um, inside that skin. So the the outside is the structure. They're folded plates. Uh, they're bolted together and they form uh, effectively a monocoque. When Ollie talked about a, a sort of sleeve that everybody travels up on the stairs and uh, across the deck and back down again, that is a structural U section um, made out of folded plates. And the, it's the only the inner surface which is uh, removable, which is non-structural. So that's designed for robustness, but it also has a series of access um, uh, so all of the cable runs, uh, the lighting and everything else is tucked uh, behind that inner uh, stainless skin, which then has removable panels for access and maintenance. All of the bolts are accessible for uh, inspection from by removing those uh, inner panels so that you can inspect everything from the inside. There are no bolts on the outside um, and we've been very, very careful 
uh, with a lot of frequent reminders from Network Rail that, that we mustn't have any hidden crit critical elements um, that we can't get to. So we've done our damnedest to make sure that's not happening. Thanks, Thanks Chris. Yeah, we yeah to add to what um, Chris mentioned there, we've been yeah collaboratively pushing the designers very hard in this area, noting the uh, quite right nervousness about HEEs followed it in the Stewarton incident in uh, late 2000. Um, so yeah, it's something that we continuously are discussing with the designers uh, and noting also that the devil is in the detail with this. Thanks, Anthony. Uh, following on from, um, uh, I guess, the um, the design element, um, has geotechnics, um, sorry, ha has it been considered the geotechnics involved in the design and construction of the project? Yep, so we have, um, as I said, the multiple things. Firstly, we wanted to take, it's a geotechnics and geotechnical construction. So I think Phil mentioned that the the impact of trying to build a foundation in a live railway platform is a is a major cost disruption and actually it's a major carbon generator as well in terms of embodied energy of the of the concrete. So just digging a big hole and chucking concrete in it is not going to happen. Um, so we are using an entirely dry system. We're using screw piles in some geotechnical situations we may use driven piles steel steel tubular piles uh, and a steel grillage so we're replacing piles and pile caps or um, pad foundations with that system and uh, the screw piles are actually raking to take uh, lateral loads which are not enormous but you know, we have to take them and um, also the lift pit as i mentioned earlier and i think phil covered is a very minimal lift pit. It's of the order of 600 millimeters deep as opposed to the normal 12 to 1500, uh, which means that the excavation required within the platform, beneath the platform, and the disruption to existing services is minimized. So, oops, somebody's come up on my. Um, so, overall, and of course, it's a case by case basis, so we have to consider the geotechnics of each site. And we've, for, for the Wimberpool site where the demonstrator's going, uh, we have done a full site investigation and that's concluded that screw piles are a good solution for that site. So that's what we're using. And so it's all dry construction. So in the same way, the superstructure has no welding or minimal welding. The substructure is all dry construction with no in situ concrete or wet trades. Thank you, Chris. Um, we've got uh, I think you, you've already answered a few uh, other questions on the chat pane, but we've got quite a lot of questions on the drainage. Um, so uh, currently it seems that the roof uh, of the staircase is pitched towards the centre of the staircase, which might not be ideal for users. Could you um, comment on, on the drainage design? I'm happy well, to say you want to pick one. that one up? Yeah. 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 Uh, so the yeah, so the, the roof profile on the top side is pitched into a central gutter and we did this to try and reduce the, the number of gutters um, rather than pitch to the outside and have um, edge gutters. Um, we know they're very difficult to maintain as they're directly over the overhead lines. Um, so a central gutter is nice and wide, nice and deep, and we've done that to try and uh, reduce uh, maintenance uh, burden. And what they do is they um, they collect in a concealed uh, gutter hopper at the base of each stair, um, which is uh, quite wide, so it collects all the water which is coming down the stair pitch. And that itself then has a couple of outlets per side, which drain into a downpipe uh, concealed within the structural V supports. Uh, and then on the underside of the, the, the roof, um, what we've done is we've kicked up the edges, and this is to let um, let more light in. It's also to make the roof appear uh, a lot more lightweight. Uh, when we were drawing options before and we had a very uh, chunky edge profile, it 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 dominated the entire bridge. Um, so that's a really um, a really key decision we've made to to make that roof profile as light as possible. Um, yeah. Thanks, Oliver. Um, we've got here quite a few questions uh, I've noted through the chat uh, about, um, I guess, whole life costing and design life. So um, 
could anyone comment on what the design life is for this overall structure? So the so the design life, the intended design life is or service life is 120 years. The of course um, things like the lifts, the lift drive systems, um, the uh, a series of smaller components like the lighting, the cabling have a reduced life. And so for those elements, we've provided uh, simple access arrangements and replacement arrangements. But the one of the principal intentions is not just to provide something. So it, because it's all made of stainless steel or aluminium, we're trying to provide something which has an inherent, uh, it's an inherently no noble material, um, meaning that it's um, what you get at the beginning is still has quality after an extended period, unlike uh, painted uh, carbon steel, for example, which gradually det deteriorates and has to be maintained. So it's unpainted at the moment. Um, of course, you can paint stainless or you can you can finish stainless in many different ways. You can patinate it. But the problem with that is and we're trying to avoid it is we're, we we end up with something which then needs maintenance. So our intention is to try to produce something that is sufficiently simple that the temptation to bugger around with it uh, in terms of adding stuff to it, which then needs maintenance is reduced on the lifts, which I don't know whether Phil picked up. So the lifts are designed specifically um, so that they can be maintained with a minimum disruption to the operation. So you don't have to climb up into a motor room on the top. Um, what happens is that the it has double double motors. It's double electric motors. They they share they have a shared um, camshaft, which one of which can with the clutch, meaning that you can decouple one motor or the other motor, and that single motor will still drive the lifts while the motor that you're replacing or repairing can be taken away and um, can be then replaced, and the clutch can be. Um, um, re-enabled at which point you're back to the dual system. It's got dual belts. The same thing applies to the belts, which are also done in cassettes. So, uh, and a series of other uh, redundant features to do with power and backup systems, um, including battery power, battery backup. So there are a bunch of um, operational uh, longevity things, which mean that, yes, you have to maintain things like uh, some of the lift components, but over the life of the um, project, uh, it's easy to do that compared to current situations and you can therefore extend the life over and over and over again. And as we said earlier, I think, and Ollie was describing the interior um, of the parapet system and the soffit of the roof, all of the services are accessible from inside the, uh, the walking surface so that the requirements again for maintenance um, and replacement of the services are, and actually if people want to add additional services, that can all be done without having to have complex access requirements um, which have both safety and um, operational disruption issues. So it's, a, it's, it's, we can't say that everything's going to last 120 years, but the intention is if it's properly maintained, it will last for 120 years and it will be just as good at the end of 120 years as it is at the beginning. That's our, that's our intention compared to a mild steel bridge with poor access to services, with lots of things bolted on afterwards and with a lift system which is designed to be um, reminiscent of a, um, uh, a watchtower in somewhere in uh, medieval Italy, which we get in lot, a lot of stations. All right. Yeah, if I may. If I may add to, to that, because I think as civil engineers, we use the term 120 years design life a little bit loose, too loosely, really. So our current steel bridges have got a design life of 120 years, but uh, to achieve that 120 year design life, the bridge needs a number of either repaints or major or, major or minor refurbishments during its uh, life to achieve that 120 years. So in theory, we should be repainting our footbridges with an N1 paint system every 30, 
35 years approximately. Um, and each time we have to repaint one of our uh, footbridges in a live railway environment, we know that that is also a very expensive exercise in itself. So the 120 year design life when we apply to the Ava bridge is 120 years with minimum amount of maintenance slash minor and major refurbishment. Thanks, Anthony and Chris. That was really great to hear. I'm um, just a little conscious of time because we've overrun a little bit, but are you, you guys okay to maybe take two, maybe two more, one or two more questions? Yeah. Okay. So um, we, we haven't had any questions yet. We've had actually one question here on procurement. So um, how will procurement and commercial processes be created and managed for this project? Do you want, well, the two things, uh, Anthony should probably pick that up, but just one observation that the one of the requirements of the Innovate UK funding, which is government funding, so it's taxpayer funding for this research project. Also, Network Rails funding is effectively taxpayer funding, um, is that the um, whatever comes out at the end of the two year research program is available to others to be used. So we make it open source for others to use at the end of the two year program. And of course, we, we were hoping to be ahead of the game and be able to use our designs and our manufacturing technologies quicker and better than others, at least in the first year or two or three, but um, it's available for others to take on. But Anthony, I'm sure wants to uh, qualify that from the Network Rail side. Yeah, so as Chris touched on there, so intellectual property under the contract is is shared intellectual property. So we Network Rail have yeah joint ownership of that intellectual property, and our aim is to open source the uh, the designs at the end of this um, process to encourage as many uh, yeah organisations as possible to to embrace this and utilise utilise it. So we develop a competitive market for this. The the procurement of the Ava Consortium. Uh, in some ways was traditional, in other ways not traditional. So it was part funded through uh, an Innovate UK bid that we won. So we had to bid for funding for part of it. Uh, the Network Rail funding that we've put in is through the Network Rail Research and Development Programme and Walker Construction are acting as the principal contractor. So our main contract is uh, using a Network Rail contract with Walker Construction. I, I touched on in my opening piece about future challenges to achieve the what uh, Henry Ford did at, yeah, uh, with the Model T uh, and to get efficiencies in manufacturing. One needs a supply chain, so one needs to have a, an order book effectively. So that's one of the other many benefits of doing this project under the Living Lab, which is part of the Department for Transport, that we're lobbying hard and informing the Department for Transport using data about the efficiencies that one can gain from multiple ordering of footbridges at the moment within the industry. And it's not just Never Rail that do this. We generally will go out to the marketplace with one or two or three footbridge packaged up. But if we went out to the marketplace with a much bigger order book, we could expect to see efficiencies from the manufacturing element. Thank you, Anthony, and thanks, Chris. Um, perhaps let's uh, finish off on, uh, we've had a few questions on accessibility, and uh, I'll read one out from Carlos Malachas. So he mentions, thank you for the presentation. Congratulations on the beautiful, well-composed and very functional design. I was just wondering if the ramps have been considered at any point of the design, more for cyclists other than users, really. And I guess this uh, goes on to, you know, accessibility for wheelchair users as well, I suspect. Yes, yeah, so I'm happy to take that first of all, then maybe uh, maybe Oliver. Uh, yeah, I, I did respond. Uh, well, I, I thought I pressed send in the in my writing there with that, but um, modern accessibility standards are moving away from the use of ramps uh, as an accessibility method. It's something we have used historically uh, quite extensively on the railway network of using ramps to get up to these station footbridges. Uh, those ramps, because of the height and the gradient of the ramps, need to be yeah, very, very long. And we question the user experience that that provides um, all types of users who use the rail network. 
Hence why with the revised BS8300, it really drives designers down the route of using lifts um, and larger lifts at, at places where you've got accessibility needs. But I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that, Oliver. I think, yeah, I think definitely on the user experience. Um, and as, as we move towards um, uh, more reliable lifts, um, I think it's a no brainer really that these should be put in wherever possible um, instead of these crazily long and not particularly nice to use um, ramps, um, especially even in terms of carbon and maintenance liability. These are huge structures which need to be maintained um, and include a lot, a lot of steel. OK, thank you, Oliver, and thanks, Anthony. So um, I guess we'll we'll finish off here, um, but uh, so I, I just want to say um, a big thank you to Anthony, Chris, Oliver, Noel and Phil, and of course Ross as well for presenting. Um, it's been a very interesting presentation. We clearly had a lot of um, a lot of interest as well over 50 questions and apologies to those in the audience who we couldn't um, we can answer or get to, to those uh, through to those questions. But um, once again, thank you very much to um, to um, the presenters. It, it was a really interesting topic. So um, I'll wish you all a good evening and um, for the RCA um, um, attendees, please do remember that on the 10th of June, We've got another presentation on the Warrington Dive Under. So if you do want to uh, uh, listen into that presentation, all of the details are on the ICE website. So thank you very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.